Disclaimer, wow. I was not expecting so much of the man to see actual code. So guys, heads up. I will not be showing any code for this series, but I have a very exciting product announcement coming soon for you all. So please be patient and just give me a little time to build it. But if you like this series, I think you'll like what's to come soon. Now let's start part two. All right, so I just spent some good time training for us on this course here. I'm now about to generate a completely new course he's never even been on and see if he can complete it first try. I'm very nervous, but here we go. Nope, still got some training to do. Hey, welcome back to writing my first machine learning project. Come on in, have a seat. Candy, suit yourself. Let's dive right back into it. But real quick, if you haven't watched part one, I highly recommend it because I'll be using terminology from it. And oh, don't worry about me talking to you without moving my lips. As the producer of this channel, I can do whatever I want. But I digress. Now that we've designed Forest Brain, it's time to train it to do whatever we want it to do. Which remember, what we wanted to do is complete two laps on any given course so that I don't have to help Forest anymore. Now, if you've checked out some intro to neural networks before, chances are you might be thinking we're gonna use backpropagation to train Forest. But, all right. Let's pause here for a second and really break this down because this is something that kept me confused for quite some time. The training phase is often assumed knowledge in machine learning published papers I come across, so for starters, backpropagation is not the only way to train neural networks. In fact, it's only just a part of one of the many ways that we can train a neural network. Let's start from the top of the hierarchy. In some machine learning cases, you'll need to collect data to train your neural network on. But for this neural network, we'll be collecting our data while training, so we can skip this part and start with designing the neural network structure. Now, we won't get into detail of the various neural network structures because there are so many with their own pros and cons. But if you're curious to know the different types of neural network structures used, here's a chart full of lots of different types, and you can read more on them from the link in the description. However, the forest brain that we've designed in part one is a simple feed forward structure. After designing your structure, you can finally enter the training phase for your network. And a lot like the designing phase, there are many different training techniques that we can use. But some of the most popular ones are supervised learning and reinforcement learning. Now, these techniques try their best to explain what they're all about in their name. Supervised learning means as it sounds. Just like teaching someone how to drive a car, you will correct the neural network anytime it makes a mistake like so. You give it inputs, it calculates a prediction based on your inputs, you tell it the correct answer, and it will then take small steps correcting the values in its network to give a more correct prediction. And over a number of times training it like this, the trained neural network will be able to take your inputs and make correct predictions from it. Correct enough predictions. <laughs> Damn you, 0.01%. And so, how does the network know how to correct its values, you ask? Well, algorithms. Now, please make sure you pay attention to this part. Each training technique has its own collection of algorithms to use for training. And backpropagation is actually only just a part of a bigger algorithm used called gradient descent for the supervised learning technique which is pretty much taking the partial derivatives of an error function with respect to all neural network values. And, uh, man, there, there's so much to unpack with machine learning, I just can't unpack it all in this episode. So if you wanna learn more about backpropagation, gradient descent, supervised learning, and more, I've added a few really good references in the description that help me understand it all. Check those out and feel free to post any questions in the comments and I'll try my best to try and answer those. But moving on to the other popular training technique, reinforcement learning also suggests what it's about in the name. Have you ever trained a dog to sit and gave it a treat whenever it successfully sat? And over time, it understood what you wanted to do whenever you told it to sit. Well, that technique is from a chapter in psychology called positive reinforcement. Or how about when your dog pees in the house and so you yell at it and throw it outside for an absurdly long time and over time, it doesn't pee in the house anymore also from a chapter in psychology called negative reinforcement or something like that. I was never able to understand this confusing chart from psych class, but basically reinforcement learning is using rewards and punishments to train a neural network. And though it's very possible to train for us using supervised learning, even in this dynamic environment, and honestly, probably the better option to go with, we'll instead be using reinforcement learning to train for us brain because it's a lot more fun to show and easier to understand. Now, again, there are a lot of algorithms that we can use with the reinforcement learning training technique, but 
because I'm already dying to start training forest, we're only going to explore the algorithm that we'll be using, which is called a genetic algorithm. But guys, wait, hold on. Although not completely visualized here, it took me a very long time to understand neural networks until I was able to visualize this hierarchy. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I'm a visual learner. So to all my visual learners out there, please do not take this visual for granted. Okay, now that we figured out the complete route that we're going to take for our neural network, let's finally, finally get to some training. All right, Forrest, start training. Forrest, you're not making any improvements. Is my genetic algorithm not working? Error. What is a genetic algorithm? Ah. Uh. Right. There's a difference between knowing how to train a neural network and actually training one. <laughs> Silly me forgot to show Forrest how to improve using a genetic algorithm. So let's do this now. Oh, and Forrest, please never speak English again, man. That was f***ing creepy. Now, genetic algorithms borrows almost everything from evolution. And if you want to learn more about it in depth and be able to write your own, I highly recommend Daniel Shipman's Nature of Code series. It's incredibly good, and he has it available in both book and video form. Link is in the description. But in terms of teaching Forrest how to use a genetic algorithm, it's going to work like this. As Forrest trainer, we're going to tell him that he needs to train every single day doing 50 run attempts a day. And here, we meet our first of four problems. When he starts running on day one, he has absolutely no understanding of the course. So what should he do? Well, just randomly guess a thought process to use for each run attempt on that day. What in the hell does a randomly guessed thought process look like, you ask? Oh, well. I'm so glad of you to ask. This is what a randomly guessed thought process looks like. And don't freak out. If at first it just looks like a string of numbers, well, that's because it is just a string of numbers, you little silly. But this string of numbers is actually perfectly mapped to our neural network's 29 connection strength and bias values. And this right here is what gives Forrest the ability to understand courses. Well, after we train him, of course. And so because of that, we'll call these string of numbers thought processes from this point on. And this is what my thought process looks like anytime anyone tries to talk to me about politics or sports. <laughs> I get one lame joke per episode, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. So now, after all 50 thought processes have tried to run two laps, Forrest needs to figure out their ranking from best to worst, which is our 2 of 4 problem. In order to figure this out, he needs to first figure out how each thought process did. Now, there are many, many, many ways that we can go about figuring this out for our genetic algorithm, and I'm sure that you can think of some creative ways yourself. But here's one good way that I thought of. If we take the sum of all of his five distance inputs, average it, and then add a percentage of that in real time to his how well I'm doing score, or what we'll appropriately call his fitness score. Side note, we're only adding a percentage of the average to keep the fitness score range on the smaller side. Right on? Right on. When we think back to the whole point of reinforcement learning, we will find that this easily calculates both his reward and punishment at the same time. I'm going to illustrate its effectiveness with these three examples. As you can see by the first two thought processes, the one that can see the furthest in all directions naturally has a higher score, because it's pretty much showing that this thought process is the furthest from walls. The exact opposite of what we want to do is hit a wall, so great job, you get the most reward. And the third example has a poor score because it has a greater chance of crashing into the wall. So thought processes that end up like example number three will naturally get a low score as a punishment, and will likely not be used to make new thought processes for the next day. But in addition to that reward, since we also want Forrest to be able to run the course two laps and beyond, we're also going to add a multiplier to his score for every lap that he completes. Which remember this, because it will come in handy just a little later. So, after run attempt number 50, Forrest will then look at how all the thought processes perform and will learn from them to create new and hopefully improved thought processes for the next day. Which introduces our 3 of 4 problem. How can he use his old thought processes to create new better versions? I mean, sure, he now knows which thought processes are the best thanks to the fitness scores that he's recorded, but what values from those thought processes need to be changed to improve? Well, simply put, we have no idea. You see, if Force only had one input, that'd be a one-dimensional problem that we could easily graph, visualize, and configure our neural network on a whiteboard. If he had two inputs, that's a 2D graph. Still pretty simple. Three inputs is a 3D graph. You get the pattern here. But he actually has five inputs. So that's a five-dimensional graph that's really hard, if even possible, for our puny human brains to try and visualize. 
I mean, it's still small enough that you could figure it out by hand, but nah, why bother when we have genetic algorithms that can solve this problem by mimicking nature like so. We're gonna take every thought process from the day and give them a probability based on their fitness score. The higher the thought process performed, the better the chance that Forrest will use it for tomorrow's 50 new thought processes. And back to our lap multiplier, this is where being able to complete laps can have a huge benefit. The thought processes that can finish more laps will have a mighty higher probability. So now digging deeper into biology, we will then do some sort of thought process merging to create 50 new and hopefully improve thought processes for the next day. This tactic called chromosomal crossover in biology has been working out well for nature for billions of years. So it's probably a good starting point for us to use as well. Now, I don't know much about biology, but my best guess on how chromosomal crossover works is maybe randomly choosing between two aligned values from two sequences for each aligned value in a sequence to make a new sequence? Let's see. Quick Google search, chromosomal crossover, no, I'm a visual learner, uh, huh, all right. Well, maybe, and probably more accurately based on my quick Google search, we can randomly slice out a section from a thought process and slip in an equivalent section from another thought process, and voila, a completely new and hopefully improved thought process will be born. I say hopefully because honestly, it could increase, decrease, or do almost nothing to performance. <sighs> Man, so much to unpack, but this is what we're dealing with. We have two different crossover functions to choose from. Which one will be better to train for us with? Who knows? But we will test for this a little later. Now the last and final problem 404 that we need to talk about is this pool of thought processes. As you remember, only on day one will Forrest randomly guess 50 thought processes. And if we keep it like this, he will likely run into a problem in machine learning called local minimum, which in the most lame explanation possible, this is where your neural network becomes as good as it can be based on your starting values. To illustrate this problem, let's just hypothetically say that the only value that matters is a value of four in the second value spot for a thought process. And let's say through our entire thought processes pool, not a single thought process has a value of four in the second value spot. Well, no matter how many days we train for us, you will never figure out the course because we've essentially told him that from the first 50 guesses you make on day one, you'll be able to solve this problem, which in this case just isn't true. So we could either wait until we see Forrest hit a local minimum and then train a new Forrest from day one until one of the thought processes in the pool finally has a value of four in the second value spot. Side so note, this is why I said supervised learning probably would be a better option. Or we can do these last two things for our genetic algorithm. One, sometimes tweak individual individual values just a bit for new merged thought processes, and two, make the last two thought processes of every day randomly guessed again just to add fresh new thought processes values to the pool, which of course is what we're going to do. And now that Forrest knows how to train using a genetic algorithm, Forrest will then repeat this process every single day until he can complete the course with two laps. All right, finally, it's finally time to start training Forrest. Are you guys ready? Let's begin. Oh wait. Sorry. The very last thing I promise that you need to know is that because Forrest is only a bot in our computer, we're going to simulate all 50 of his runs for the day at the same time. This will not only allow us to train Forrest a lot more in a short amount of time, but it'll also be a lot more exciting to watch. All right, guys, let's finally do this. Forrest, start training. <laughs> Wow, that was pretty underwhelming. He beat the course on his first day of training. Well, whatever. This is a thought process that learned the course. So let's see if that same exact thought process can successfully run the course in reverse. Wow, would you believe that? You're already an any course running master, Forrest. Looks like my job here is done. Where is my candy at? Error, error, course too easy. Need harder courses to be sure. Forrest, didn't I tell you not to speak English? It creeps me out, man. I will continue to talk English until you train me on harder courses. The quick brown fox jumped over the lazy dog. The quick brown fox jumped over the okay, lazy okay, dog. Okay, okay, all right, fine. Brown Forrest, fox jumped. Just for the love of all things pure, please stop talking. <laughs> all right, 
Look, guys and gals, admittedly, there are perhaps millions of thought processes that can solve this course because this isn't challenging at all. I mean, just look at it. You yourself can easily randomly guess 29 numbers by hand and maybe even solve this course first try. So I'm going to make a little course builder and put Forrest through some serious training. But my friends, please forgive me because we will do this on the last and final part three. My editing fingers are very tired. 